might see. As you might see, I I I, I did some some prep uh, work on the on the mirror boards, and I so I created a board with the expertise uh, keyword. So, as I understood, it was the most voted by two people, me and Kevin, <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, I was thinking maybe we can try this time the sort of uh, island layout uh, to expand the idea of um, of the keyword. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> so basically, you have these uh, hexagonal tiles that you have some, you know, on top and the right right hand corner. If you if you don't want to go to the tools each time. Um, and yeah, so today we are on the E later and it's expertise. What do you, what, you know, Mark, you, you shared this one. Uh, what, what did you have in mind when you, you oh. came up with this word? Yeah, so, <coughs> sorry about that. <coughs> yeah, there we go. Um, we, uh, there's a couple of things that popped into my head. One is, I mean, there was a moment in a talk not too long ago where it felt like the notion of expertise was actually met with some hostility. Kevin, you may remember. Yes. You know? <laughs> um, and so I, do. I think, but, but I do think it's, I think it's important and I think it brings up some really interesting questions. I think one of the questions that it brings up is that unlike sports or something like that, um, design is a, is a kind of a cognitive process, right? Um, so it's related to thinking and I don't want to say design thinking specifically, but just more, more broadly, it's a, it's a cognitive process. And the idea of expertise in this case assumes that you can, improve your thinking, improve your cognitive skills and build expertise, mm -hmm. right? So I think that's, that's a really interesting, interesting idea. And then the other one, and, and I think it's one that we kind of implicitly understand. I mean, even by having these conversations, right? The idea of becoming a better designer means that there is some kind of vector that you can improve over time. And mm -hmm. then, and that there is a kind of, um, a way that designers make decisions that changes as they improve, that they rely less on or adhere less on kind of specific models or patterns or methodologies. And then they move into something that is more context based. And then they eventually move into something that kind of goes beyond the context into some kind of projection of future contexts. Right. And so that there's this increase in, in the way that we reason about the problems that we face as designers and that there is a that there's a difference between the way that somebody who has a lot of experience would go about solving a problem to somebody who is uh, a beginner let's say and so if i guess the first one is to uh, test whether that whether we think that that's true and then the second part that i find is really is kind of interesting about this is at what point do we talk about judgment, right? Like yes. what is the role of judgment in that, in that kind of improvement, right? Um, and so I guess those are, the, those are the things that were interesting to me about this. And, and I didn't have a lot of time to prepare, but. Ah, what happened? Okay. Hey, is it me or we just, uh, I, just, I, I broke down for me too. Oh yeah. Okay. So, so it's Kumo's face. They did something and we, <laughs> so we didn't yeah. uh, hear the, the end of your, of the sentence, Mark, sorry. Right. Oh, I was going to say, yeah. So the only, so digging through my library of stuff, um, the one, the one book that I found, um, that encapsulates this fairly well is a little bit older. 
um, and it's conveniently enough called Design Expertise. Um, mm -hmm. Originally written by Keys Dorst, and I've got the translation from uh, Brian Lawson in front of me. Um, and it goes through that, and I think that's probably where my foundational kind of understanding of that transition from beginner to expert kind of comes from. I was just going back through my notes from that. But yeah, that's, I guess that's the, that's the groundwork, mm -hmm. I think, in terms of why I was thinking about it. Okay. Do you have something in mind, everyone? It, you know, it's funny because there's a part of me when it comes to expertise, it's kind of like, uh, I believe it was attributed to, I can't remember the Supreme Court justice, but you may have heard the quote in the United States. It was basically, um, I can't tell you what pornography is, but I know it when I see it. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think in, in some ways, for some things, so it's nowhere near universal, because I think oftentimes we're designing in areas where we don't have a lot of, we just don't don't have the capability to, to you know, we, we don't have the experience around there. But I do think that there's times where, like for example, expertise. I can tell a very skilled practitioner going into a situation where they are very confident in what they don't know. And that doesn't prevent them from, from acting. They, they, they come in with a clear sense of what they know, what they don't know, and what they can offer and what they can work with people on. To me, that's in a strange way, a real sense of expertise um, that you can see in somebody. It's yeah. almost like this, 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 this ultra humi humility, if you will. Um, so but I'm trying to think about what does that, act, it's like a tacit kind of a thing. Um, it's, it's like the inverse of Dunning-Kruger. <laughs> yeah is what it is right that you that by understanding the vastness of the realm and the fact that your expertise is often fairly narrow and that in a given project your level of expertise can be widely like wildly different between different aspects of the project right but understanding the boundaries of what you feel comfortable feeling like you have a handle on and the things that you know that require either another person or research or something like that is, a, I think, a key to being able to to work in this environment. What comes to mind to me is actually that <clears throat> associate expertise with taking actions, even if what you uh, what you propose to be doing may not be the right thing, but this mere confidence that you are ready to take the step and move the project in a certain direction, I think is what comes with certain level of uh, experience and expertise. <clears throat> because for these that are, for the people that are less familiar and uh, don't kind of <clears throat> know how to swim in this unknown territory is very difficult to begin. So I somehow think that expertise, it can be exhibited when, when people are willing to take a step forward uh, for the project. Not, not necessarily knowing that um, this is ultimately the right thing to do, but just to, to make a move. I think um, somehow when Cameron uh, was talking about that's what came up to my mind. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing is that in the, in the Keys Doors book, as I remember, he makes a lot of um, kind of analogies to learning a music instrument. I think he talks about like a flautist at one point. And I've always found that to be a really interesting model as well, because there's a point like, like I can, I can strum a few chords, but to be honest, the guitar still plays me. And there's a certain point at which you overcome that and you start to actually like master the instrument in a way that you can make it do things that other people can't do. Right. Or you can, you can push the limits of the actual instrument. Um, so I think that's a that's a really interesting notion of expertise as well. Your ability to kind of <clears throat> overcome the material and really start to play with it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. You know, it's interesting about that is that to talk about the material is that I think one of the things around that is that uh, an expert, as we're using it in this case, is somebody who I think understands the material and the craft of organizing material into something, even if they do not know what the thing it is that they're going to. Like, just for example, say you're, you're doing some strategy work. Your materials in that case are your ability to form, you know, to, to have some empathic perception. You need to be a little bit personable. You need to be able to work with people. You need to, you know, help. You have to have a certain level of patience and all that kind of stuff. And I, to me, that, that's almost the materials are. Whereas, say, if you're a graphic designer, you need to understand the digital interface. You need to have understanding a little bit about color and, and you know, usability, you know, UX and stuff like that. And I think that that's, again, not knowing what you're going to create, but I think that the, the expert um, has, a, has a handle on that um, and knows, knows what materials do and how they can be done, how they can how they can be done, <laughs> how they can um, be applied. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, I would say there's something about you know this is one of the critique of uh, of uh, expertise or experts at least is that they they are good for one specific thing, but we cannot expect from them to you know to know everything and the fact that we are conflating their expertise in in one specific domain and you know the fact that they their expertise in this specific domain kind of tend to contaminate our perception of their global expertise, their overall expertise, right? So there's something about the fact that they are experts in a, a, a really specific domain. And so by their experience, through their experience, they created their, you know, this 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 is this sense of creating your own uh uh, ordered uh, space where where things are clear for you, at least for you, because you you master this kind of uh, domain. But then it begs the questions where where people can be experts of something complex. You know, can they be experts of something really unclear and com- and complex? And what happens to to this space when we actually have experts in this? You know, like it's kind of uh, interesting um, it's, it's, it's getting products. you know increasingly difficult to actually become an expert at something it's just it's no longer that easy or soon it will be no longer possible to become an expert at something if you hear someone is like an expert in complexity i think like that sounds like a scam <laughs> to me <laughs> i mean it's, it's it's terrible but you know it's like the, the only way to do maybe the to to learn to balance expertise with the world is maybe that uh, concept of the T-shaped people where you have this, you know, focus, maybe a narrow focus on something that gives you the perspective, but also you have this array of uh, understandings and kind of try and overcome the bias of your area of expertise that doesn't let you question. Because, you know, I mean, Romanians are known to be the experts in everything. A Romanian sitting in front of the uh, TV will be able to become a president. That's how good they are. But <laughs> what's interesting about it is that when someone is actually an expert, they are very good at what they do. But and they begin to project that expertise on every area of life, and they think mm. through it, which is sometimes is useful. But many times it becomes very impractical. So expertise actually can make you weaker in life, and just because you're good at your in your field, that doesn't make you a better person or a you know, kind of, mm-hmm. yeah, it's, there's a balance that I think we seem to be missing when we have too much expertise. I think that's true. I think there has to be some kind of way of understanding that you narrow down your mental models that you have built up for yourself and that you need to challenge them. And so there is a kind of responsibility. Mm-hmm. I, think, I think something else that's interesting too, when you talk about complexity is the, is Differentiating between having expertise in working in a complex ecosystem versus having expertise of the material itself, potentially. Right? So if you're, 
I mean, I don't know. Is there is there a difference in that? Is there is there a difference in that you your expertise is actually like in humility, as opposed to being an expert in the end thing? You just know how to deal with complex situations, even if you don't fully understand the situation. And part of your expertise is admitting that you don't understand the situation or can't. Not in, mm -hmm. not in a kind of like a full way, right? Does, does perhaps expertise maybe, I'm trying to think of it because I think that's an interesting point. When you're in a complex situation, and I mean, is, is maybe expertise is we're talking about it also tied to confidence? Because in many cases, and the reason I say that is because the idea of the knowledge, I mean, it's almost, it's very difficult to objectively assess. Like, I may think I know what I'm talking about, and but in a real complex situation is the only way is if I actually do it and show it. And I actually know, not only know know what I'm talking about, but that what I'm talking about has clear and appreciable value, as opposed to I think I know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. and I'm going to try and argue my way around it. Um, so it almost feels like it's it's like tied. We have to bring in confidence in some way, and an expert is, you know, like like if you think about a, again a complex situation where there really isn't a lot of precedent, somebody who's an expert that humility. The ability of understanding materials and craft and having certain perceptive skills and you know cognitive skills and all that other stuff like that means that they feel confident that they're going to be able to provide something that that yields more benefits than drawbacks even if they're not exactly clear what that that exactly is as opposed to somebody who might have a high level of skills but really isn't clear on what value they add i don't know i'm not I'm just kind of thinking aloud there. I'm thinking that probably in these situations what is what makes somebody an expert if if you can <clears throat> contribute with a new idea uh, based on your knowledge so that you can show how by understanding these intricate patterns and you can make a relationship between ultimately unconnected areas um, you you can put forward something new so to me actually this is a I was going to say uh, before that, that I was wondering if expertise actually expires, but then I kind of argue with myself saying that if you know how to create these patterns, probably expertise from that uh, context doesn't expire and you, you kind of carry the skill no matter, no matter what. You just have to be indeed humble to acknowledge that perhaps your knowledge may be outdated so that you can onboard new kind of knowledge, but mm -hmm. ultimately the skill of this pattern creation and looking for these new new really interesting connections maybe maybe it's more lasting than uh, i was initially considering i don't know i mean <laughs> i have to renew my driver's license it would be really funny if that was the thing that kind of happened you know your, your expertise license is <laughs> uh, is expiring you need to go and <laughs> well I, you, you know crazy actually that's an interesting point and and i it kind of got me thinking because it's almost like there's different types of experts so for example like there's riding a bike you almost never forget how to ride a bike even if you've never ridden a bike in 25 years then there's stuff that you've learned that like you just forget you oh yeah i forget about that theory or that method or that sort of stuff and and then there's the things you kind of just get out of practice with like if, unless you're doing it regularly, you, you're just not as good as you once were. And, and all three of those things are kind of a type of expertise or are embedded within expertise. And it's interesting. I think maybe this also comes back to the humility thing, <laughs> maybe knowing when this is just a bike thing and that once I get in there, I'm going to know how to know what I'm doing and I can perform it at whatever level is necessary versus I'm just out of practice. Like if you think about it, how much modern education is predicated on this idea that roughly, you know, you spend four years or whatever it is, X number of years in a program, and therefore you've got all the knowledge you need. Like mm -hmm. as if, could you imagine like, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm going to get involved in an exercise class. I'm just going to take the exercise classes for about three or four years. And then that's good. I'm fit for the rest of my life. I don't have to ever do anything else. Um, Which is what some it. does, you know? <laughs> <laughs> exactly what some some are doing you know it's like exactly that i know some yeah. professors that are you know 
with the same knowledge as in 1999. <laughs> so. Yeah, but, but to come back to what Mark is saying, I mean, there's times where it'd be like, you know, you just renew your license because it's like, you know, it's your bike riding license. Yeah. There's a whole other thing about, like, are you renewing, like, are you up on things? Like, are you, or are you sharp on things? Those are two different areas of yeah. expertise. I want to I want to to say something about the fact that we first we we discuss expertise with without specifying if it's expertise in knowing something you know because you 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 learn the knowledge about this uh, about this thing and expertise because of of practice which are kind of you know a bit too, I would say a bit different because you could have like a, an academic expertise and something and never went in the fields and actually tried anything. So it's, it's like a, not uh, incompatible. And, and I do feel like we, we, are, we are speaking of expertise in terms of uh, uh, one individual. But uh, maybe it's interesting to see what, uh, you know, in, in terms of context, what is expected from expert, experts in general or from people with expertise. Because in, in, in fact, I do feel like people, experts tend to, you know, provide answers to questions even if they don't know because this is something that is expected from them. And there's some kind of pressure on their side to provide one clear and unique absolute answer to something when they actually know that there's, you know, like it's approximate, it's not so clear, but we expect them to have clear answers, not to say, I don't know, right? <clears throat> oh, maybe maybe we are, you know, uh, experting, ex sorry, <laughs> expecting <laughs> uh, things from, uh, from, uh, from them that uh, are from our own expertise and something that is not actually realistic. I don't know. Actually, what I experience is that those that I consider in my uh, career expert, they are the ones that most often would say, I don't know. <laughs> the ones that never admit that they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they are, of course, yeah, in my, in my book, <laughs> they were never an expert. So I don't know, it's kind of like a paradoxical because people that really can grasp the whole picture and see it holistically, they're the one that would first say, oh, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not the expert, even though they probably are most equipped. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. But you know what, what's interesting is, is that there's also like field expertise. Like, you know, I'm just, I'm trying, as, as, as you're talking about this, I'm trying to run it through a scenario. And I'm thinking about you know, the, the kind of stuff that your industry standard, like, you know, this is what we teach in school, design school, business school, whatever it is. And you, you, you understand what the fundamentals are of the theory or the method or the approach. But over time, you come to learn how to adapt it or modify it or abandon certain pieces of it relative to, you know, like, like people are giving you a generic set. And the idea is that you go out into the world and then you start to figure out, you know, for the kind of work that I do, I don't really need this stuff or I need to modify this thing. And this stuff is like canon for me. I, and and uh, it's like an expert kind of knows that. Like mm -hmm. that's one of the things that they do is they have a sense of like what their tools are, which ones they need for the kind of work that they do. And I, and I would think that they would have an idea about what the what their field says. Because aren't we talking about like relative knowledge, like expertise, like relative to others? I, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to, I, again, I'm just talking, I'm thinking out loud here. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm thinking about the, the non-experts as well and tied to what uh, Kevin was saying that we're actually creating these expectations on what it means to be an expert. And as a non-expert, I am expecting that the expert will have the answers. And when they say they don't know, I'm like, well, what the hell are you an expert <laughs> at? You know? uh, so I guess, you know, it's our own attitudes towards experts that shape the, the, the kind of expectations and also how do we relate 
to knowledge in general. And, you know, you get different cultures, whereas, you know, let's say in the East, there's this uh, tacit understanding that you don't have the answers to everything. So you kind of go silent and try and figure out an answer. Whereas in the West, everyone's like, yeah, I got this. I, I know this. I know a lot of confidence. So. Yeah. Well, you know, what's funny it, uh, is you're just saying that I was thinking a little bit about of, of an experience I had when I was, I was still training at that point and was with uh, another, like a psychologist who was coming in to do some group work in a community. And, and, and this, the, the senior person I was with was coming in with this sort of um, a profound level of humility that I, that went over and above what was needed. So we're sitting in a group here. We're basically coming in to try and help a group of individuals solve some, some problems and stuff like that. And, and he gets in there, it's a pair of us. And he says, before we, we start going, he says, we're not the experts here. You're the experts. You know, you know, you know everything. And I kind of looked at him and, and I was thinking, they're the experts in their lives. They're the experts in the problem. They're the experts in the context. But I think we're the experts in the, in the helping through this stuff like this. If we're not the experts, why are we here? Like, <laughs> we're adding nothing to this conversation because it's not our problem, <laughs> you know, sort of thing. And, uh, but it was this humility. Like, he's like, oh, we're not experts. I'm like, well, you we kind of are in this one little thing. We just don't know the whole thing. And that's where everybody else is. Like, it, it came from a good place, but it, it, it just came off badly. And I just kind of thought, yeah, that sounds like, anyway, it was just, it was, it was a strange thing. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, you know, it's good not to have experts at the table because they are not seeing the full mm -hmm. picture, but yeah, this humility is uh, always a dangerous thing <laughs> because it, it might be misinterpreted. But I was thinking about a different concept that kind of struck with me as uh, Mark put that uh, Twitter experts. And it made me think that there's this phenomenon of mass expertise when, you know, you adhere to a theory, to an ideology, and everyone knows everything they need to know about vaccines all of a sudden. And right. then they well, firmly believe and adv advise others. But, so. but two weeks later, they're experts in geopolitics. <laughs> yes. <Right? laughs> The same people. <laughs> it's impressive. I don't know how it they is. do it. Yeah, <laughs> if only we could tap scary. It it's, it's, it's really scary. Yeah. Well, and at the same time, at the same time, you know, the 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 fact that it's on on Twitter and that uh, there's some kind of uh, you know pressure to be short and concise and it it, it creates fake experts like you are. You are just saying something without, you know, thinking of the the weight of it, and suddenly you realize that you just gave um, an expert opinion. <laughs> you know, it's like it's just no, it's just like that. I'm just saying that, you know, like that. But it can be totally interpreted as a as something like absolute, like what what we could expect from an expert to say, actually, you know. Yeah. Well. You know, keep in mind also scope of practice, if you will. Like there's there's the expertise that you get within a very narrow thing. Like, so for example, you do a PhD. Generally speaking, if you're doing a PhD on a particular topic, you probably are going to emerge as if not the world's expert, one of the world's experts. Like you're going to know almost everything there is to know on about an incredibly narrow piece of universe uh of, of you know but but you will know that you will know that probably more than anybody because you'll have spent all that time mm -hmm. so you could say well oh, i'm an expert in this topic but then there's like well but you're 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 studying in a particular department or discipline well you have a lot of knowledge in that and and, and it totally depends on what context is that you might be it's like well you know if you <laughs> study some 16th century phenomenon you know, that happens at this one particular place, they might say, well, you know, you know about things that happened in this century. You have this expertise. But then when you in, are in another crowd, it's like, oh, well, you're a history expert mm -hmm. because everybody else around us is, doesn't know anything about history. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, like you, you can see where the the definitions change depends on the context and where you're at. 
to be great. Yeah, but the factual information is the same. You know, you know the same thing that doesn't change throughout time. So it makes you think about intelligence. What's intelligence and expertise? Uh, kind of what? How do we pair them together? Because you can be an expert without being exceedingly intelligent. You just have to know <laughs> enough to be called an expert. <laughs> Especially with PhDs, you know, like I was looking at these PhD students and some of them are extremely dumb. I mean, I'm sorry for them, but, and they have a PhD and I don't. And I'm like, what decides the trend? <laughs> but this actually made me think of something. Can expertise be acquired without practical knowledge? It's almost absurd. Why would I trust somebody only sitting behind a desk mm. reading book and all of a sudden, uh, to kind of like rely on a wisdom from a paper, I don't know, but I would never actually put a high value on that. I would rather prefer somebody who had their hands dirty and had played and applied and failed multiple times. So uh, I understand actually, the value of research and all of that, but I really, mm. if I have to choose, I'll go for those that uh, actually, that I. I I do feel like there's something interesting in what you are saying, uh, because to, I wrote something about, you know, uh, expertise that is necessarily shared amongst uh, a community. And I do feel like you need all of those people to make like the big picture, right? So you, you need, you need like uh, one expert in, in, uh, you know, a, a domain of knowledge that is not practical, but gives you insights and, you know, some kind of, usually when it's not practical, it's, it's, uh, it's about, uh, either like, uh, uh, something where, where it's not possible to, to apply like practical knowledge, like, you know, and, or administrative stuff, or, you know, where, where it's about knowing how something uh, operates, you don't need practice for that kind of thing. So, so you know, you need those kind of people. You need some people that are like really into the practical stuff and you need people in between that are, that varies in terms of understanding of the subjects. And so this creates like some kind of good, you know, ground for, for creating like the big picture because the experts will speak only about something really specific and you need to extract yourself from there to, to, to be able to, to, to gain this broader view. So, I would I would say it de it really depends on what you are trying to understand and and do. You you need at some points you might need all of them, but I agree that it's hard to say if if you are only expert on something that is written in books, and and you are operating in you know in the practical fields, you would probably perceive it as something like not necessarily useless, but some kind of not really relevant to you, because you know something that is totally different. Or might be conflict, conflicting something that is written in books, and it's not I like a paradox. Yeah, these, these ideas that come on the re research and let's say theory are almost like uh, the frontiers for any new innovation to, to happen later. So that if there are no practical applications, this shouldn't stop people dreaming of and figuring out the theory behind. But somehow i almost feel intimidated when i see somebody with the doctor title and then uh i hear others who have much more like uh, experience on the field but they never dare to to come forward because they don't have the accreditation from that context and it always had bothered me yeah. why is it why is it like that but yeah it's that it brings up an interesting question, though, about the, the way the ecosystem places the expert, right? So what is, what is asked of your expertise? Like, does the expertise make you the leader? Does the, so if there's this external, and, and in a way, it's the same way that when clients hire you as a designer, you know, do they, do they treat you like an expert or do they treat you like a waiter? You know, like, I mean, I've, I've had a client in the last, you know, whatever, two months say the client is always right. Like, just do <laughs> what I tell you to do. Uh, Ex-client. Uh, 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and not 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 specifically for that reason. I mean, just just in general. But but there there's a there's an externality to expertise in the way that it's used if it's embedded in a human, right? That the organization kind of decides. Well, what is that? What is the value of that expertise? And if that expertise is potentially overvalued, then the organization will get into trouble or the project will get into trouble. Mm -hmm. Right. But yeah. And, and I think those people who read, like those people who are, you know, academic experts, as long as the role that they are cast into in the ecosystem is relevant, like, for example, putting actions into historical context, for example, previously when this happened or previously when, you know, institutions tried to implement a large scale course of action, these are the outcomes that have happened and you are repeating these patterns. That becomes really valuable, right? And, and, and the expertise there is understanding the historical context and being able to make connections between other actions, often at large scale that failed, for example, or that were successful, right? And mm -hmm. those things are, and at that point, it becomes really valuable. Now, I have a question, because if, if we look at this, uh, what the, the island we just created, and now we, we ask the question, what, what it means for, you know, for designers or practitioners if they want to become better at what they are doing what what that means because we are saying both at the same time that yeah you need to gain experience to be an expert in something so it sounds good right but at the same time we say we are saying that it's not so good for many other reasons we just discussed so what would be like some kind of elements that you want to add that, you know, uh, address the question in, in regards of becoming better at what we are doing? First of all, I don't think anything in here, for me anyway, suggests that having expertise is bad. Or, and I'll even, I'll even go further, I don't think there's a point where having greater expertise is less valuable than having less expertise, right? That, that in this case, more is better. But I think that it's also not a static concept, mm -hmm. as Crossy pointed out, right? That, that expertise mm -hmm. is not something that you achieve, but it is an operational thing that you work through, that, you, that, you re that, that expertise requires ongoing work, right? Um, I don't mean, and I don't mean like you need to like, like you need to work on your expertise. So you happen to be an expert at something at some point. That, well, that it is, that it has a that your expertise has a half life, mm -hmm. right? That you that it does decay, and that you need to that you need to work on it, and that part of expertise has an aspect of wisdom. That so you know what you don't know. And that becomes important as a, an important vector to your expertise. But it's interesting to look at it visually, you know, like the, the island metaphor here, because you see how expertise has these, uh, you know, how deep is the fuzzy territory into the expertise. And I think that stands out a little to me. It's there, there's a high degree of uncertainty and there's, uh, an absence of knowledge within expertise that helps you become an expert. The fact that you don't know is seems to be equally fundamental to you know what you need to know to become an expert. And I think this is decisive. This is what makes maybe a good difference between good experts and let's say bad experts, if we can create such a distinction. But just that level of preparation or and the awareness of what you don't know, I think it's really important. Uh, so yeah, I think that stands out to me. You know, becoming a better designer to answer the question is really having that awareness, that limit, not as an insecurity, but really being humble about what you cannot achieve, but trying to to do better every day. 
understanding mm -hmm. this work in progress. There's also something about the fact that we, we, we are talking, if we are talking about, des, you know, the design and designers, we are talking about a professional domain of expertise that is expected at some point also, right? So this, if we come back to the, the expectation part, we expect designers with a specific title, especially with a specific title, to be experts in that specific thing that they are doing, right? And, and we know that it comes from mainly from practice. Um, but there's some expectations about, about it. So it's not, it's, it's in a way it's unavoidable and it's what, how do you, as you said, how do you find the right balance in, you know, in what you are doing? Yeah. You know, one of the things it's also, much of this is also a um, realize how con contextual it is. So <coughs> let's say I don't know you jump off a bridge with a parachute. You've never done it before, but you decide I'm going to grab a parachute, big tall bridge. I'm going to jump off and do some sort of like base jumping kind of thing, and you're like, wow, that's incredible. So then, you know, afterwards, you're you're you go down to the pub with a bunch of people and talk about things you've just done, and you go, "Well, I I've just jumped off a, a, a bridge with a parachute." <laughs> Somebody says, "Well, you're the expert here on jumping off bridges with parachutes because none oh, of us have ever done it and have any idea what to do. So you know how to do it." You're just crazy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it's true. But if you think about it, how often we, we attribute ec expertise to having an experience or certain yes. experiences. Like, you know, like I remember, uh, oh, this was a while ago when we were talking about failure and, and talking about examples of failure and in business and life and partnerships and stuff like this. And I was you know, just reflecting back on those things. I said, well, I, I've had some pretty profound experiences in that. Am I an expert in it? How much of it do I need to have to, before I go, you know, I really, you can trust me. When I talk about failure, I have expertise that I can share with all of you. <laughs> As opposed to going, I'm just somebody who's failed a decent amount. Like, what, what does an expert look like? It's an interesting question because there's certain times, again, you know it when you see it, but I don't know. Can you become an expert at failing? <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's some, yeah, there's some areas of life that you you, it makes no sense to to be an expert at. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I know a story possible, about that because you learn. It's not possible to constantly fail. At some point, you just learn. So. Oh, well, I don't know. <laughs> well, actually, yeah, I, I know, I know. First of all, I think we, I think we found the letter F. <laughs> Failure. <laughs> Failure. Yes. I think we, we know that one, but yeah, um, I think it, it, there's that when uh, when we were kind of working at one of the the big startups that I worked at, and we would look at the stuff that we were looking at. We're like, well, nobody's ever done this before, and then the guy, the head of marketing, would always say. And this is well known, a well known turn. He would always go, Well, you know, in the land of the blind, the one eyed man is king. You know? <laughs> Which is kind of like the that's your that's your um your parachutist, you know, yes. kind of analogy, right? It's this this notion of, well, nobody really has experience, but this person has marginally more experience <laughs> than others. And I was talking I was talking to a friend of mine the other day about her experience like through COVID and and how how it kind of worked and I mean, she's somebody who's who's been through a lot, um, and and you know, and, and we we both kind of have, and we both fared fared it fairly well for you know, I mean, luck and among other things. But uh, but she said to me, she goes, yeah, you know, some people have really never come up against any adversity, but those of us who have our sea legs seem to have done all right. <laughs> and this notion of kind of like having your sea legs, of having been through it before. You know, it's um, I think I think that does that lived experience does help you um, understand how you react to certain things and what's useful and what's not and how to let go of certain things. So just from a 
from a life perspective, live experience is true. And I mean, you know, as a really Canadian example, uh, if you look, there's this thing in, it's called the trade deadline where all these teams who are going to make the playoffs in the NHL, like, um, like they, they make their final trades and they give up enormous amount of futures for current players. And the ones that are most valuable are the ones that have like been to the finals or won a cup or something like that. And you, they want those people in the room because they understand the amount of effort that's required. They understand what a slog it is. They understand like the processes of, of making that happen and performing under immense amounts of pressure. And, you know, mm -hmm. like that, like those things are all relevant to the organizational knowledge that you bring those people in who have their sea legs and that makes the organization more resilient. So are we rewriting the, the pain they went through in some way? I think what it is, is the, the wisdom of having understood or having gained perspective on what's required, right? Mm. So, this is a, a bit of a, if I may, just a, a bridge almost between Krasi, what you said and, and Mark, what you just said. And, and so I, I'm trying to explore this in my head here about failure, expertise, and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. So uh, this time of year, Uh, like between you know usually January and about mid-April, uh, which is now, uh, is always my busiest time of year because I have a lot of clients that have to get things finished for like usually a lot of the uh, people who work in nonprofit or government or anything like that. Their fiscal year end is end of March and you usually get a couple weeks extension. Mm -hmm. So uh, I work with my clients because what happens is um, I end up having an overabundance of client work. It's just because of the way things are. I always know it's busy and stuff like this. So what I try to do is, is organize with my clients to make sure that, you know, I don't get requests in bulk at the last minute because they're all, all trying to do a bunch of different things. Try to manage things really well. So I was talking to somebody about this and I said, I have this one client. So I had done everything I needed to do for this client in December. And I knew that they had a final report to have, have to be submitted by the middle of April. So I started saying, Hey, uh, can you just tell me what the outline is? Because I'd really like to get on this so I can, uh, can, you know, get, get it to you nice and early and stuff like that. Yep. 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 So anyway, um, I do a number of things. So I, I'd written things into a contract. I uh, just brief, you know, about getting things up promptly on time and stuff like this. I'd sent out around a work plan a few weeks before that. It all been approved, you know, hey, everything. I uh, I would follow up on emails. I would point out notes. Fast forward, basically, I get uh, the specifics about what goes into the report about two weeks ago. <laughs> of course, everything's all happening simultaneously. I'm just like, you've got to be kidding me. I had... You name it, like it just is as I did whatever it is that I could, and they're like, "Oh no, we're just, we're getting we're gonna get there." So I was telling somebody about this, and I said, "You know, I just I, I get so frustrated with myself. I'm like, keep trying something else." He says, "How long have you been doing this?" I said, "Well, this kind of work specifically, at least, well, about ten or twelve years." He says, "Yeah, I don't think that's I don't think that's you. I think that's them." <laughs> the point is, is the, this is about the failure. So the point is that I keep thinking I failed. And what he's trying to tell me was that, no, you haven't failed. It's, it's, this is the way they are. You're not going to get what you need in advance. It's just, you know, if it is, it's luck. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just thinking about this. I'm thinking, so I'm learning. So question is, is what am I learning? Am I learning new ways to not do this? Am I learning that there's no point <laughs> like working too hard because it ends up in the same place? And it does. It almost always like the litany of, of techniques and tools and tips and tricks and everything like this I've done to try and stop this from happening. is just like goes on and on. And it almost, it, it does work sometimes, but most of the time it doesn't work. Um, so what's my expertise? Am I an expert in just simply knowing that next year, same thing, just 
get Why lots of sleep. You failing, you know? You should conduct an experiment of failing them, so next time they are becoming cautious and they will give you what you need in time. <laughs> it's a bit yeah. of a risky one, though. But... Yeah, yeah, I mean, because it's interesting. Like, I'm sitting there thinking, so what am I an expert in? I feel like I've, I've earned a lot for expertise. I failed, but what have I actually learned? <laughs> Aside from just, you know, I give up. I mean, I, I've learned lots of things I mean, to fail. I, I mean, fail and failing. <laughs> at the same time, the, you are facing a system that is not capable of, of, of changing. You know, it's like there's no feedback mechanisms in their side. It's not possible for them to to learn from the situation and to and to adapt and 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 change course of action next year. And you and you know that I mean all big companies, all big you know institutions is exactly like that. You know it, you know that it's a period in the year that it's it's crazy. Everything needs to be done anyway. You know, and and people are just uh, waiting for it <laughs> in a sense, like yeah. because the systems in you know, in, it incentivize them to, to 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 do other things before this period. So they are not focused on this on these things particular that you will need, but they are in you know one hundred other things. <laughs> so yeah, it's like you know, it's like I know this, and uh, uh, yeah, I do feel like some sometimes you either you you learn to live with it or or you just stop doing it at all. Yeah. Sometimes it's the, yeah. there are the only two like extreme solutions. <laughs> you know. The other the other thing too is if if you have a client like that and you're continually pulling their ass out of the fire, they think the process is working. Oh yeah. Right? True. It, that's true. That's part of that's part of it too, right? And so you're like, well, and we've had internal conversations about that with clients where everything is a well what the the um we call what you just went through a fire drill, like where everything's a fire drill, right? <laughs> then you have a, it's, it's just, it's scrambly and it's nuts. And you either accept that that's the cost of doing business with this client or you walk away. Mm -hmm. The advantage you have as you have more experience is that you do come very quickly to that. It's them, not us kind of realization, which provides you a certain sanity in the process because otherwise you're it's like being gaslit right you just kind of yeah. you know especially if the client is um is aggressive you know mm -hmm. in the way that they deal with you or something or something like that you can push back and basically go no like you know we're not the problem here like we've outlined a process for you to follow and here are the deadlines that we gave you and the stuff didn't come through you know and then the other one is to um is to well what we've done in the past is to do it with with money Basically, like we will, we will say, okay, if this, if this happens and we need to pull overtime, we're going to, this is going to be the extra on the fee for getting this done. Right. And, and, and we're very clear about that threshold. Look, if we don't have this by here, then, you know, we're going to have to move other stuff around and that's not going to be free. And a lot of clients are actually fine with that because the money is worth less to them mm. Than the change in the organizational structure that they would need, and so it's not even True. aggressive on our part. It's more like, like if you want to work this way, then this is what it's going to cost. And a lot of, a lot of organizations make that, you know, make that calculation and are fine with it. Yeah, talking about rationality, it's <laughs> usually yeah. in organizations like they prefer to pay more than changing the system. That's actually yeah. Yeah. Totally That's mind, being an expert doesn't make it easier. <laughs> no. Yes. I, I'm, I'm hoping nobody gets that impression. <laughs> that <would> be... <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, and I, but I think you know, going back in terms of the design stuff, I think that there is like, like if there's no vector of humility in what you're doing, like there's no mix of wisdom with your expertise, I think that's where you get into trouble. Right. Mm -hmm. Or, or if you like, you, yeah, if it's a static concept, I have now become an expert and therefore I don't need to do that. When I, I once, yes. I once taught, I once taught for a, um, with my first big teaching gig, I was just taking over for a summer for a, a professor 
um, and it was 2000 and oh man, three or something like that. And it was two carousels of 35 millimeter slides for each class. It was a design history course. And it was that I could tell that it was the same stuff that he'd been using since the early nineties. Right. So it's 14 years worth of 14 years worth of the same curriculum. You know? And I get the efficiency in that. Like the history hasn't necessarily changed or anything like that, but you know, it's, it's like stuff had happened since then. <laughs> so, yeah. But. Oh. Uh, fortunately, everyone, I, I'm going to have to go. I've got to, I've got to jump off to another meeting. That's yeah, my Tuesday. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for joining. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Good, Good to see you. you. Yeah. And we, you, hopefully everyone. we see you again in, in two weeks and we talk all about failure. The topic about which we're likely all experts. <laughs> oh. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye. Okay. Oh, uh, on that part, I just want to say there's some areas of life where, where, where people are, and, you know, it makes no sense to call people experts. And I was thinking, like you know, like in in uh, in uh, in the kind of uh, religious aspects of it or stuff like that, they are not talk we are not talking about experts. We are talking about gurus, right? <laughs> something like that. <laughs> Is it something kind of possible? Experiencers, you know, these people who have a profound experience and are willing to share it with others. They're not experts, but they are kind of yeah, the sea legs, maybe. Or yeah. Like that. And when, yeah. when we were doing the um, citizen journalism site that we did, or product that we did years and years ago, called Now Public, one of the things that the premise was that all these people were walking around with cameras in their pockets now. And what does that, what does that mean for, for news in general? And one mm -hmm. of the kind of terms we came up with was this notion of um, subject matter experts in presence. That is your expertise was just being there. You weren't the person who was going to tell the story or anything like that, but your, your expertise was about being in the right place at the right time with the right um, device. And that was just the, that was the extent of that expertise, right? There was no more, mm -hmm. you know, there were mm -hmm. other experts who were going to make, make sense of what it is that you saw. But so there are different in a, like you say, in an ecosystem, there are different, levels of expertise and they're all required and some part of that expertise is just being there i mm -hmm. think it's a bit dumb to just say like let's say it's a simple task like i don't know taking a picture of a landscape i can't call this simple action as i am an expert just because i have a phone and i see a mountain and i'm taking a picture <laughs> whereas like I, you know i'm not a photographer all of a sudden but we tend to have this you know we we loosened the barriers of what makes us good at something, what makes us skilled, because there's no longer enough uh, critics, enough, I don't know, what, what do we need to keep it in balance? You know, like there's so much content flowing, so much action, yeah. so much activity from everyone. That, yeah. You need, you clearly, you clearly need some kind of uh, self oriented uh, critical thinking about yourself, about your knowledge, you know. Uh, I, I do feel like there's some kind of uh, uh, an interesting theme with uh, being a good skeptic of your own abilities, you know. Like, mm -hmm. you know that you know things, but you know also that you don't know things. And so this, you know, is like this kind of uh, sword uh, on top of your head that says you might not giving the right uh, thought about it or you might not providing the good answer and you know why you could be wrong you know actually <clears throat> yeah the right said i have decided now listening to all this talk on expertise that maybe i should become an expert at something <laughs> what. <laughs> what should i become an expert at that's uh... mm. what do i what do i want to spend the next five to ten years doing <laughs> Yeah, but like in a highly concentrated way. It's like, I, you know, I want to be good at my job. I want to be a better designer, but I don't want to be an expert designer. It's that's 
I don't I don't feel like this is my ambition. I wanna learn yeah. other things. But an expert. Yeah, I, I do feel like there's something interesting in being you know, in being a good designer in in trying to be an expert at other things that being a designer. You know? There's something interesting in the relationship between what you are doing, uh, you know, uh, on your day-to-day job and how you can connect it to other things that are, you know, on the first, at the first look, you, you would say they are not connected at all, but you can find really interesting relationship and ways to transpose your, your expertise in other things in your work. You know, it's like there's something really interesting there that's, yeah, that is, uh, I do feel like linked to also your way to, to be creative with your skills, you know, and knowledge. Don't know. <laughs> I, the last thing. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. no, I think it's true. Well, you look at some people who are in the... I think of somebody like Steve Martin or somebody like that who does a range of things. I mean, he's an, a brilliant comedian. He's an amazing musician. You know, he's it's range, but it's range within the the pro, the creative process, hmm. right? Or those who write and act and direct. And, I mean, they're all kind of related, but they the skills are transferable because they understand the processes. And so I think, or, or even if it's like, like wildly different, there are always you're by by being good at something else, you're breaking your frames in a useful way. Mm-hmm. Right? And I think that's part of what we're you're talking about with that kind of self awareness and that that developing I guess I guess you understand what it means to develop expertise and by just understanding what that means applying that process or having that knowledge and bringing it into a different sphere um, makes it easier to master that other thing potentially. Yes. Because you have a, you have a certain standard or certain level Mm. of knowledge about the process that's required, the amount of dedication, the concentration, you know, the return to practice, all those things. So I think that, yeah. Yeah. And and it helps, it, it helps clearly your, your intrinsic motivation to, to try do things, you know, because you you can you know that you already try something with code similar in mm-hmm. elsewhere, you know. So you, you know what it takes exactly as, as you said. So you might be more keen to to give it a try and you know be less worried about what we talked about earlier, failing. But there's something think. we didn't touch at all on, which is yeah. the natural inclination, you know that makes someone more talented or more keen on becoming an expert at something than mm. others, you know, like mathematics. Not everyone is wired for mathematics to become experts. I can understand some basics, but I will never do uh, quantum physics and, I don't know, fifth dimensional mathematics equations, whatever. I, I have no understanding of that. Mm. I don't think I'll ever get there. So I'm just thinking it's like, how does it fit into the what you're born with or your upbringing from the earliest phases, not when you become fully conscious and taken on the path to become an adult? Yeah, I, I wrote one, one, one thing in the, in the map, which is inequalities in access to expertise. And I do feel like it's, it, it, it links to what you are saying in the sense that we are not, not all equal to access some expertise by the fact that we are we are feeling that we are good at it or we are feeling that we are uh you know um actually like th- there's some not easiness but some kind of yeah in you know deep interest in what we are doing when even when we know that we are not doing it totally right you know and then as you said uh keep on trying and we are not all equal to that. Like p- personally, like mathematics is is my it's something I really I, I really had a lot of difficulties when I was young. 
and I learned to learn them through another lens when I, I started to to do like uh, more, you know, uh, uh, interested. I was interested into uh, research with users, and I, I started to learn back how to use like quantitative and qualitative stuff, and I, I relearned mathematics basically. <laughs> Uh, then I started to to appreciate what they what they are, where where school clearly taught me to you know hate mathematics more than anything anything else. So, yeah. Yeah. So there is this influence of the the group and the society on that plays on the on the any knowledge, any experience. Actually, experience, I feel like if you have to draw a clear distinction between the two, is that experience is more intimate. It's more personal that you, you don't have to like share it. People don't have to know about it. But when it comes to expertise, kind of everyone knows and validates it. You can't just become an expert and then no one knows about you or you know, you're not showing it off. It's, yes. it's, it's by doing, while as experience is more like being. Mm. Yes. Um, I had something in mind right before before that, but I I forgot what it was. <sighs> you felt silent, Mark. Well, I was thinking about this notion of um of skill and expertise and kind of like what you're born with. And I think maybe that's like, I, I go back to, to sports in some way for that, that you, that certain gifts that you kind of, you know, come out of the genetic lottery winning, <laughs> allow you to allow you maybe to master things more easily and project your ceiling. Right. Essentially. Mm -hmm. That there are that there are certain people with certain gifts, certain types of muscle fibers, certain body compositions, certain mitochondrial kind of alignment, or however it kind of happens, that lend themselves to being, you know, sprinters or something like that. And then they need to work and work and work. But at some point, the kind of natural ability will determine your ceiling, like how far you can actually go. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would expect that that's the same cognitively as well, right? Or or through empathy or or any other kind of aspect of of your personality or kind of skill set. And I think that's you know that's that makes experts unequal. Yeah, okay. Right? Which I think is which I think is fine. I mean, I think that's. That is the variety that is. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I do feel like probably in terms of uh, cognitive abilities, there's some things that you can escape that are not just limitations of your, you know, of the way you are born, but uh, also the kind of, of uh, you know, of context you are, you evolve in and the kind of societies that you are living in. Mm -hmm. And so you you can expand your you can expand expand your understanding or perspective on things just by you know uh, traveling or living elsewhere in in a place that that is totally you know alien to to you and you will learn to to see things in a different way uh, even if you don't realize it so. Um, yeah, there's some limitations cognitively that you can escape, but I agree that we are not all equal in in terms of uh, some some aspects of it. I agree. But I think in terms of in terms of equity as well, if the ability to access those means of improvement so that you become an expert is unequally distributed, that also means the areas of interest to which that kind of global or collective expertise is applied is also affected, right? So that the mm -hmm. that there are fewer experts maybe on, you know, development of certain parts of the world than there should be, 
right? Because it's not an area of interest that is equally distributed because the people who have access to becoming experts or at least, you know, being recognized as experts mm -hmm. that then puts them in those NGOs or whatever places they are gets, you know, so that there is a trickle down effect as to who has the access to become an expert. Yeah, right. I agree. And, and the fact is that we, 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 society evolved around, you know, evolved on those topics. Like you were talking about being uh, those, I, I don't remember the name of this comedian that you, you were talking about. Like he is uh, good at, you know, in different kind of fields. Oh, in different... Steve, Steve Martin. Yeah. Yes. And, and, you know, today is something that we actually recognize as something positive, but in the past being a comedian and doing like business or doing something like that, at least in Europe, Uh, it was not perceived as something good. You were, you were, you know, with this uh, tag, uh, you are a comedian, and that's yeah. it. You cannot be something else because people w would not understand it, and so it would prevent you to actually do something else. And in the same way, like you, you, you say, being an expert in, I don't know, in <clears throat> some kind of. Uh, Uh, indigenous uh, culture, for instance, that were not perceived as something interesting at all for Western societies, for instance, uh, is now being more and more recognized. And we are expecting experts in that field. But maybe, as you said, we are lacking them because we, we for so long, you know, didn't realize this part of knowledge was interesting to us or useful or whatever, uh, however you want to frame it. I'm, I'm not framing it uh, in, the, in the proper way, but you know what I mean? It's like, uh, I totally agree. It's, it's, it's the way the society itself perceives those things that creates opportunities for people to, to be experts in, 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 in different areas, you know? So, yeah, clearly it's... Uh, Yeah, this is what I meant uh, earlier in the discussion that we, we can look at it as a as an individual uh, as characteristics uh, attributed to one individual, but we can look at it as characteristics that we that that are more contextual and and um, and and probably society itself creates the the kind of experts that they expect. That is that are expected in in us in the society that we are living in, and we are not able to have to have different totally different experts or expertise uh, because of that, and and we just don't know about it, and we cannot have expertise and not knowing uh, you know uh, about the thing that we don't know because because it's not possible that they exist at all. So it's kind of a you know this this weird paradox that they it do exist in science as, as well. Like the more they, they discover and the more they realize they don't know. So it's exactly the same, <laughs> the same process, you know. Yeah, this bias, you know, will exist in terms of, you know, the quality of the field you're in. You know, it's like if you're an expert in uh, the field of uh, medicine, then you're kind of more important as, a, let's say, a neurosurgeon rather than you're an anthropologist. You know, there's like people sure. will judge these things you know being a linguist or you know in the humanities being like an expert in general is not as highly valued as you know into what it means to be in a more scientific community because of how yes. it is perceived so you get this difficulty as well people are not becoming experts because they are being pressured into sticking taking you know what is more reputable if you want to follow a secure career path and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. <sighs> It's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm. Well, we have a big island. It's one of yeah, the biggest we, we, we created, to be honest. I I really know, it's like very it. rich. Yeah. That's a shame I cannot share the screen in the Kumo space, actually, to... <laughs> for the, the recording, but uh, yeah, I will add the link in the description of the video so people might, will be able to see the results. 
Yeah, I, I find it interesting that there's a lot of fuzzy, unclear space in this island, actually. And 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 in contrast, we have like quite a lot of uh, you know mountains. Well, I, I, at least they are really visible, you know. And but the shores are very interesting because you have like the way they're placed. You know, there are a few shores, but they're like very inland and they're like surrounded by the fuzzies. Yes. yes. It always it always looks like an island that's good for cliff diving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. That's true. <laughs> You know, I would love to take the time to actually take this uh, 2D representation, flat representation, and put it in perspective and see actually the the depth of uh, of the of the map with the the representation of the train. Although it lacks, you know, granularity, it would be interesting to you know to say, oh, there's mount co cognitive skills, there's uh, you know uh, cliff uh, inequalities. Uh, stuff like that, and mm -hmm. the jingle of knowing when you are when our expertise becomes irrelevant. Wow, that sounds like <laughs> poetic. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> that's funny. Yeah, I think we should use this format next time as well. I think it's uh, yes. much better as a structure. We could start at failure right in the middle. Ah, oh, it's gonna it's gonna haunt us. <laughs> uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to sign off. I got to get ready for a call. And, okay. Um, thank you so much. Enjoy your evenings. Yeah, you too. Thank, okay. you. thank you. Thank you. Bye. Time.